<laughs> Everything's moved around. I feel like I've been gone for a year and have no idea what it is that I'm doing. Um, <laughs> hopefully it doesn't come across that way, <laughs> except I just told you. So, um, well, good morning. I am so glad to finally be back. Um, thank you so much for your abundance of prayers while I was out sick um, with a nasty sinus infection, and which at, one, at some point I eventually thought was COVID, but then I got like three tests, and I was jammed up the nose three different times throughout the week, and every single one was negative, and so that was just a miserable experience just to know that I didn't have it. Um, but praise God that I am here and that we get to continue in our series uh, in as we walk through the letter to the Galatians, which we've been learning is really primarily about asking that, that fundamental question, how does the gospel teach us to live? That's the question that, that Galatians is trying to answer as Paul speaks to them, speaks to the people in Galatia, about how they should live because of what the gospel has done in their lives and how it is for informing how they should live their lives. And so, so far, we've, we've walked through just the first chapter of Galatians. And, and first, we learned one primary thing, that there is only one gospel. Paul was so clear to iterate that there is no other gospel. There is but one gospel. There's but one gospel, and we should be willing to know it and believe it and trust that it is true. In fact, we, we said that the gospel can kind of be summed up in four words, right? God's work, not mine. You could elaborate so much more on what those four words mean, but, but the gospel stands to one thing, God's work, not mine. And so that's what we learned about the, the one true gospel at the very beginning. And we're going to see throughout Galatians how Paul is elaborating on that truth that, that the gospel is God's work, not mine. And then we went further into chapter 1. And we started seeing, well then what is it when we think about the gospel, from whom do we seek approval? And Paul even asked that question, am I, am I seeking God's approval or am I seeking man's approval? And as we actually unpack that passage, we realize that the truth is you're seeking neither. You're not seeking the approval of man because man can do nothing for you. But you're also not seeking the approval of God because God has already done everything for you. And so where man can meet no need, God has already met every need. And so it's not about seeking out that, that need of approval from God. And the way that we saw this play out in our daily lives is that Paul made it very evident how he had this rhythm of gospel grace. How he, how he had these moments of silence and solitude where he would pull away and build on his relationship with God. But also how he would get in the context with with, con with the congregation, with the fellowship of fellow believers for the encouragement and exhortation about what it meant to be in relationship with God and seeing how people in their lives lived out Christ glorified. And so we've seen so far in chapter one how, how Paul is beginning to push, hey, this is what it means to live the gospel. This is what it means how the gospel teaches us to live our daily lives, how we can apply it to every moment. And so today we're going to turn to chapter 2. And here is what our passage says today in verses 1 through 10. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. And I went up because of a revelation and set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaimed among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, so they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. And from those who seem to be influential, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those, I say, who seemed influential added nothing to me. 
On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel to the circumcised. For he who worked through Peter for his apostolic ministry to the circumcised worked also through me for mine to the Gentiles. And when James and Saphos and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given to me, they gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. Only they asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. Before we go any further today, let's go to the Lord in a moment of prayer. Lord Jesus, oh God, as I stand here, I'm reminded that you are good. Oh, that you are so faithful. And Lord, that even though I, I feel uh, still unprepared, I feel wavering, Lord, even though I, I feel like I don't have it all together and that I'm, I'm feeling like I'm forgetting how to do this whole thing, you're still good. And you show no impartiality. And, and here, Lord, you, you reign true evermore and your, your spirit is alive within me. And so, God, I pray that as, as this word is delivered this morning, that, that it would be yours and not mine, that it wouldn't be from my heart, but it would be from yours, that, that your spirit would lead and guide the movement of my lips to the encouragement and exhortation of our hearts, of the grace that the gospel has brought into our lives. And so, Lord, just be with us this morning. Be with this, me this morning, I pray. We pray in your holy and precious name, Jesus. Amen. Well, as we get into this morning, I just want to share a little bit. I've shared a lot, actually, I think, about my testimony uh, with you already, or maybe bits and pieces here and there about how it wasn't until I was a senior in high school that the Lord finally captured my heart. And that was through a series of events in my life that led to that moment and, and the Lord did his work, and I am, I am beyond grateful. But what I haven't really shared with you is what happened before that. What, what happened in my early life? What was God doing in that period in time? Because God was in that period in time, whether I recognized it or not. Even today, I think that I see truth in that because I have a, a story to deliver that I hope informs us more about what it is that the gospel is teaching in this passage. But you see, before that time period in my life where, where the Lord finally captured my heart, I, I, I did. I was raised in church. I went to church uh, from very early age through adolescence. Uh, there were only a couple years, maybe in middle school and high school, where, where my family didn't attend church so regularly. But I was always going to church, always raised in the church. And so I want to I make sure that we know that, that people that are raised in the church might not always be faithful believers in Jesus Christ. It is possible to be a churchgoer and not actually know Christ. It's possible to be in this building and not know who he is. And so I, I share that, though, because I want to share a little bit about what my experience was like when I was younger in church and, and maybe why I didn't... Oh, there's no one in the choir there. Okay, and maybe why uh, I don't actually... Why I didn't have any sort of saving faith at that time. Why, why wasn't seeing the fullness of the gospel in those churches? You see, it was in that time that I felt like church was just a series and a list of do's and don'ts. All the things that you shouldn't do if you wanted to be a part of this church. You see, it was always about the church. It was never about God. It was never about Jesus. It was simply, this is what you do to be in this church building. This is what you do in order to attend worship on Sundays. This is what you don't do if you want to be counted as one among us. There's always this list of, of do's and don'ts that you had to conform to in order to be a part of that church body. And as a kid, you can see how that would be a turnoff. I was already wanting to rebel against my parents. I didn't want to do what my parents did. As, as all toddlers learn at the age of two, and their favorite word is no, you know, in the church it becomes so easy to hear these lists of things and you're like, no, no, no. And as, and as an adolescent, that's all I wanted to do is I wanted to respond with no. I didn't want to do or I didn't 
want to know what I couldn't do. In other words, it just felt like in order to go to church, I had to meet all these certain requirements just to be a part of it. And those requirements as I got older just got longer and longer and longer, more lists of the things to do and what not to do. There was no end to what it meant to be a Christian, apparently. But I didn't want that. And so I pretty much rejected the church. Even though we were going to church, I was being forced to go, right? Like, as a kid, I just wanted to sleep in on Sundays. And my parents just wanted to go to the 8.30 service. And I'm like, why? There's an 11 o'clock. Let's sleep in. But no, they, we had to get our day going. And so we would just go to the early service. And I just, I just, wanted, I just wanted to sleep. And as I got older, I was kind of given a little bit of the choice to not go, but there were still those promptings and those urgings, you need to come to church with us. And so I felt like church was just something that had to be done. If you wanted, again, even church was on that list of dues. You had to go to church. You had to pray. You had to do these things. I know now that we call that legalism. And and maybe in your own Christian walk, you felt at some point that tension of feeling like, oh, I have to do in order to be. Like, there's so much that has to be done in order to be a part of this church body, to be in this church even. Maybe there has been lists of things and things that you have felt have been thrust upon you as to be a part of this body of Christ. Maybe you felt that there are certain ways that you have to dress or look or speak or talk in order to feel like you belong here. Maybe you felt like there are certain things that you're not allowed to do. And if you would do them, that you would feel the shame thrust upon you. And it would probably never be overt or explicitly stated. And I'm not saying that that's just this church. It's all churches. Because we're all made up of people, humans, that are constantly coming to our own conclusions about what it is that people should look like. Why? Because quite truthfully, as humans, we all want a little bit of control. We want control, and we want to control others, and we want them to conform and look and be just like us. And so the church has become a place of perpetuating that conformity, of that desire to to thrust upon others what it is that we think that they should look like in order to be the right Christian, in order to be the perfect Presbyterian, in order to say, this is what it means to be a first Pres of Griffin member. Or maybe on the flip side, you haven't felt the tension of feeling like those things were thrust upon you, but unintentionally you were the thruster. You were the one that was making an imposition upon somebody else about what it is that they should do or don't do in order to be a part of this body. I know that I'm guilty of it. I know that it's very easy for me to at times look at somebody and think, well, they don't look like. They don't seem like they should be. And yet in that moment, I've I've cast judgment. I've, I've pushed something that is more than just gospel in order for anyone to be a part And so one of the questions, one of the checks that we all have to have, the things that we have to keep in mind is exactly what Paul is talking about in our passage today. As he writes to the Galatians in chapter 2, he is telling them of his own witness and testimony of how the gospel oftentimes gets something plus. And we talked about a little bit that in in our first week together, was talking about what the gospel is. We also have to know what the gospel isn't. In order to know what the gospel is, we also have to be able to recognize when the gospel is not being fed to us because somebody has given us gospel plus. But gospel is gospel. There is no plus to it. And that is what Paul is getting at in here. He says in that first passage, he says, Then after 14 years, I went again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. We'd already learned that just three years, uh, like at the beginning of this of this letter, he had said three years I spent in solitude before going to Jerusalem for the first time to confirm the gospel that Jesus had given me. 
And so he talked with, with Peter and with James about the gospel that Jesus had revealed to him to confirm that everything that he had heard from Jesus was the same thing that they had heard from Jesus. And then from there, Paul went out. And so for the, for the next 14 years, after meeting with, with, the, with Peter and with James, he went out into the world and he started to share that gospel wherever he went. We oftentimes in the church call that as Paul's missionary journeys, right? And how he went through all of Asia Minor and through Greece and was meeting and creating all of these churches, particularly among the Gentile people. But this time as he comes to Jerusalem, he's not coming alone. He's got companions with him this time. He has Barnabas with him who oftentimes is seen in Scripture as, as the encourager of one who sees the grace of God in others and is able to exhort them. And so Paul needed this, this Barnabas, this companion to be with him to constantly encourage and exhort him in his missionary journeys. I often remember in my own ministry and life how desperately I'm in need of those same kinds of people constantly exhorting and encourage me to keep pushing forward. Even just this week, I sent out a message to our elders about some things that were going on in my life and the hardships that I felt like I was having to endure. And I got messages back of just such encouragement and exhortation to keep fighting the good fight and to keep pressing on and pressing forward, but also recognizing the times that I need to step back and take a breath and breathe and relax and realize this doesn't all have to be on me. And in the same manner, Paul here, he's, he's bringing his friends with him, his companions with him, because he knows that he can't do it alone this time. He knows that he's got to go in and he's got to confront some people about some things that are happening in the churches. And so he's got to have his companions with him. And so he brings Barnabas, but he also brings Titus. And Titus is a Gentile. He's a Gentile convert, but he's not just any regular old Gentile convert, someone that he just picked from one of the churches and said, hey, you're going to come with me, and we're going to go to Jerusalem, and you're going to share your story and your testimony. No, Titus, Titus, as we know, we have, we have a letter written to Titus, right? We have a letter in scriptures that's written specifically to Titus. But why was that letter written to Titus? Because Titus was a church leader. He was a leader among the churches Throughout the areas that Paul had already gone, he was actually a convert of Paul's. Paul had shared the gospel with him and given him the gospel message. And then Paul sent him off into the world to then also be a minister and missionary for the gospel of Jesus. We see Titus's work in the churches of Corinth. And we see his work in the island of Crete. We see his work in Nicopolis. And we see his work in Dalmatia. Titus wasn't just some random Gentile. He was a Gentile that believed with his full heart and was a full servant of the Lord. And so he brought Titus along with him because he needed a true worker in the gospel that came from among the Gentiles. And we're going to see why in just a second. So verse 1 was the what they did. Verse 2 is the why. It's because I went up because of a, revolution, a revelation that set before them, though privately before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. You see that the reason that Paul is going up into Jerusalem is that he got a revelation. He received a revelation. And, and oftentimes we hear that word revelation. And I'm sure that the very first thing that you think of is, is revelation, the book in the Bible, right? The full title of which is the revelation to John. And so revelation simply means something that is revealed to be uncovered. I really like the one definition that means it is, it means to unveil or to peel back. You're literally removing something in order to see something more. And so John received the revelation from Jesus Christ that we see in the book of Revelation, right? But also Paul was revealed something as well. You see, revelation as it specifically relates to us and in Scripture, is something that God reveals to us. More specifically, that he is revealing himself to us, revealing his character to us, revealing his likeness to us, revealing to us what it is that God, who he says he is, in some way, shape, or form to us. And so Paul receives this revelation. He is, God is revealing something to Paul about specifically about himself. And so one of the questions that I have to constantly ask myself is, is, am I allowing room for revelation in my life? 
Am, am I allowing space for the Spirit of God to be revealing things, whether it's in Scripture as I read Scripture and see how the Holy Spirit is highlighting certain words or certain verses to impact me for the gospel of Jesus? But even in my daily life, am I, am I paying attention enough to feel the prompts of the Holy Spirit as He reveals Himself to me in and around me and in my world? You see, I often wonder, God, why aren't you doing more around me? Why am I not seeing you at work? And then gently he'll remind me, well, because I'm calling you to do the work and you aren't listening. You aren't allowing yourself to receive revelation. In fact, Paul wrote it this way in Ephesians 1.17, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. You see, when God reveals something to us, it is always for the purpose of revealing him more. And so when Paul received this revelation, it was a revelation about what is happening in the churches. But it's a revelation that when he realizes that something is going on, it's to the purpose of showing that God has a better plan, that God is moving and working in their midst. And so how did he do it? So that's actually something I think is really important in this passage as well, is that Paul says that he went to them privately. He went to them privately. He went to the ones that he thought were influential. And so I have to, I have to sit on that for just a second, because first and foremost, that's the biblical way. Jesus over and over again in the Gospels tells us that, that we, if we have something against our brother or sister in Christ, that, that we should go to them in person that we should talk to them one-on-one. -on -one. We should make known the thing that is going on and have that conversation, even if it feels like it's conflictual and that it might bring a little bit of tension between the relationship. It's clear. You go in private. Second, it's really practical. It's really practical to go in private when you have something against someone or when you have something that you have to bring up. I can actually remember this one moment um, when I was in ministry at another church and I was doing a teaching and a guiding lesson for some of my volunteers. And I was teaching on a specific topic and in the middle of, of teaching on that topic, one of the volunteers like started confronting something that I was teaching, started, started pushing back on, on one of the scriptures that I was reading and the way that I was interpreting the scripture and and. and talking to them about it and trying to reveal something to them about how maybe they should be or could be better volunteers in the church. But the reason that he was questioning was not necessarily because there was so much issue with it, but because he wanted, he wanted to do it in front of everybody else so that he could show that he knew more. There was that intentionality that, that he wanted me to feel a little bit inferior to the knowledge that he had. And so here's the thing, I'm always happy to be confronted about something that is, that is happening, that I'm talking about, but if he had just come to me in private, like, it would have been a fantastic conversation, I'm sure. But to do it in public with the purpose of trying to discredit is never a good thing. We should be cautious in the practical and biblical manner to make sure that when we have an issue, we go in private and we speak in private. Why? Because ultimately, in that moment, we're not just honoring that person, we're honoring Christ in that person. And we honor Christ within ourselves. And so I love how Paul is very specific to point out that he goes in private to talk to these people. But what is the issue at hand, right? Because we know why now he had to go to Jerusalem, but we still need to know the full what. And so here's the issue. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false brothers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy out our freedom, that we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might bring us into slavery. To them we did not yield in submission, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. You see, Paul was continuing to fight that good fight. The fight that he had fought from the very start. That the true gospel of Jesus would be told to everybody. That everyone would have the chance to hear this good news. The good news that 
It's God's work, not mine. That God was doing the work. It wasn't gospel plus. And you see, the problem was that there were these false brothers coming in secretly trying to undermine everything that Paul had been doing for the last 14 years. Every bit of testimony, every bit of teaching, every bit of proclamation that he had given to the Gentiles about freedom in Christ Jesus, there are these people coming up behind him and trying to tell them, well, yes, but you also have to do all of these things if you actually want to be a part of the body of Christ. If you actually want to be a true believer, you have to follow Jewish law as well. You have to be a circumcised Gentile. But that, that goes against everything that, go, that the gospel actually encapsulates. It goes against everything that, that Jesus wanted to be true. You see, it says very clearly that they were doing this. Why? To spy out our freedom that we have in Christ so that they might bring us into slavery. I think this is so important for us to understand about how the gospel actually teaches us to live. It teaches us to live free. It doesn't teach us to be enslaved to law and rule. Here's what I mean by this. And actually, Jesus makes it clear in John 8, 36. He says, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Jesus came to give freedom. His entire purpose was to free people from, from their bondage and chains to shame and sin, to the shackles that enslave them to their faith. You see, we don't have a, a burden to carry. We don't have to perform. We don't have to do. We don't have to don't. Why? Because we have believed somehow that there is a lie that ties us to gospel and, gospel plus, Gospel and if you dress this way. Gospel and if you do this thing. Gospel and if you don't do these things, then Jesus will accept you. Jesus will approve of you. Jesus will invite you into his kingdom. Jesus will let you be a part of his body. But that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel. It's further from it. Jesus came to set us free, not to enslave us. I think one of the best stories I've ever heard of this as an example actually comes from John Piper. And he's talking about his, him and his relationship to his wife and how relationship matters, right? We've talked about over and over again that, that our faith is a relationship to our one true God. It's a relationship to Jesus Christ. And so we need to recognize that as part of what this story actually entails. And so in his relationship to his wife, right, if marriage was a set of rules and a set of obligations, then if he, if he ever showed up one day with flowers for his wife, and his wife asked him, well, why did you bring me flowers? Do you think that it would get him any points if he said, well, because it's the rule of marriage. I'm supposed to bring you flowers. I have to do it. If I don't bring you flowers, then there is no love in this marriage. Then this isn't a real marriage. It is part of the obligation of being your husband is that I bring you flowers. And so here are your flowers. Is that a marriage? Is that a relationship? Is that love? Or is that being enslaved to some idea about what it looks like to be in a marriage, what it might be to be in love. But truthfully, what he says is, I just brought them because I love you. It's not that he was bound by any rule, by any law, by any obligation, but because out of a love for his wife, he brought her flowers. He wanted to show his affection in that way. And he was free to do so. And he did so joyfully out of his heart. And so in the same way, when I talk about freedom in Christ, yes, there is a law that has been given. And we should look at it and honor it, but we should not feel enslaved to it. Instead, when we are in Christ, we are free to live knowing that the law no longer bounds us. But out of our great love and deep affection for the Lord, we still see truth in it. Not because we're obligated anymore. Not because 
In order to be in relationship with God, you have to do everything right. You have to do all the things just the way he said, but simply because you love him. And so what was the outcome of Paul's time with the Jerusalem leaders? It was good. The gospel prevailed. You can see in the last uh, six verse, five verses there, verses 6 through 10, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read them again. But the gospel was heard. Paul preached the gospel. Titus bore witness of the gospel through his testimony. And they realized Paul shared nothing less than the truth of the gospel. In fact, I love, in fact, how it says about Peter and Paul's ministry that the gospel is broad enough but also specific enough to say that it doesn't matter who you're ministering to, whether it's Jew or Gentile, both can receive the same gospel and enter into the family of God and be with Jesus Christ. Not because of anything they have to do, but simply because of everything Jesus has already done. That is good news. That is exactly what Jesus wanted. He wanted there to be freedom in him. And so, what does that teach us about our lives? What does that look like for us in our everyday living out of gospel truth? I think it looks like three very different things. I think, truthfully, this is all speaking to gospel unity. The gospel unifies us in who we are because none of us have to look or be or do certain things in order to belong in this family. We can all look completely different, and yet the gospel is what brings us together. It's what unifies us under Christ, and so it looks like this in three ways in our lives. First, it is welcoming. It welcomes all people into this body. It says, hey, we're going to have open arms to embrace you and to let you be a part of our community, specifically Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to use three Acts verses for these three things. Acts 2, 46 through 47. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The Lord was adding to them day by day. They were welcoming. They were inviting. They were allowing anyone, whatever they look like, whatever background, to become and move into that body of Christ. Two, it's freedom first. Acts 10 47 through 48, this is Peter who was ministering to Jews, but God had given him a revelation about the Gentiles, and so he went to be with a Gentile family and break bread with them and eat with them. And at the end of his conversation and time with them, Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to remain with them for several days. You see, Peter, who at first didn't believe that you could be a Gentile and receive the gospel, had an experience with himself and those around him that indeed the gospel reaches many. And there was freedom in the gospel to be different and yet still be the same under Christ. Finally, the last verse of the scripture today says, only they ask us to remember the poor, the very thing I was eager to do. You see, real gospel unity looks like marginalized reaching. Acts 4, 33-35 says, And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. And there was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and, bought and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need as any had need. You see, gospel unity means that we are unified in the mission of the gospel, that we are working together to one purpose, to revealing the glory of God to those around us and specifically meeting the needs of those that have need. Whether it is those that are poor in spirit or whether those that are just poor. 
And we as a church want to be committed to those marginalized groups. I'm, I'm so thankful again for Steve and for his work at the food pantry and that we get to partner with them to meet the needs of people that are living in a time of food scarcity. They're able to meet that fundamental need of provision in their lives. Then we keep working with them. And that's, that's one way in which we as a church are living out this gospel unity in Christ Jesus. And so what would it look like if every single one of us looked exactly as Paul had said? Where we're not trying to force our ideas and ideals, our do's and don'ts on anyone not just in our body already, but those that would walk through our doors and those that are our neighbors and in our community. But we're able to welcome them with open arms and say, hey, come be a part of this gospel community in which all of us are proud and and enlivened and free in Christ. And then everything that we do is not out of obligation, but simply because we love the Lord. And he has asked us into a life with him. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we thank you. We thank you that you continue to push us and pursue us in the gospel and in unity with you. We love you. We love that you are working in us and through us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.